The Cherokee Indians had lived in what is now parts of Georgia, North Carolina, South Carolina, and Tennessee since between the years 600 and 1000 CE. After ceding much of that land to the southern states of America through previous treaties in the 1700s, the Cherokees made a new treaty with the United States establishing formal boundaries. This treaty, the Hopewell Treaty of 1785, promised that the Indians would be able to keep their ancestral land in the future. However, population growth in the United States and the discovery of gold on Cherokee territory meant that there were many white settlers who wanted this land. Despite the promise of the Hopewell Treaty and efforts from the Indians to become what white society defined as civilized, the U.S. government authorized the removal of the Cherokees with the Cherokee Removal Act of 1830. While the Removal Act only authorized removal, the Treaty of New Echota, signed by Major Ridge against the wishes of the majority of the Cherokee people, legally gave the U.S. a right to remove the Indians. The Cherokee Indians should have been removed from their native lands so that they could continue to follow their traditional ways because they did not want to submit to laws dictating their rights and because the U.S. government was unable and unwilling to protect them. By moving away from white society, the Cherokee Indians would be able to practice their native culture without interference or attempts to civilize them. In Source 9, Resolutions, in 1832, Elias Boudinot stated that the Cherokee people cannot exist among a white population and that they would be reduced to poverty, misery, and wretchedness. Many Cherokee did not want to become a part of white America. They wanted to preserve their culture and way of life. This meant hunting and gathering instead of farming, speaking the Cherokee language rather than English, and not practicing Christianity, but their own religion. The Cherokees who wanted to stay would have to embrace American culture. Some already had. Boudinot also stated that the Cherokee Nation cannot be reinstated in its present location. This was due, in part, to the interference of the white Americans. But the Cherokee way of life was also being negatively affected by the shrinking of their country. In Source 3, a brief view of the present relations between the government and people of the United States and the Indians within our national limits, Jeremiah Everts had argued that the Cherokees had ceded to the United States all their best land. By moving to a new territory, they would have access to additional land and resources that they were running out of in their original location, such as deer to hunt. Access to land and resources would enable the Cherokee to live as they once had, before the whites tried to civilize them, and grow and prosper as a nation. The Cherokee people did not want to be controlled by laws that they did not create defining their rights. The U.S. wanted to create laws to do exactly this. Andrew Jackson said that if they remain within the states, they will be subject to their laws in Source 1, his first annual message to Congress in 1829. In Source 9, Resolutions, Elias Boudinot stated that the Cherokees consider the lot of exile immeasurably more to be preferred than a submission to the laws of the states. A good solution to this problem would be for the Cherokees to accept the propositions of the Treaty of New Echota, Source 11, proposed by John Ridge. Subsistence, four millions and a half in money to meet all expenses, and a large addition in land. This would remove them from the control of the United States government and allow them to make their own laws in their own country. The United States had originally made promises to protect the Cherokees against all interference and encroachment, Source 4, but failed to do so. An example of this is President Andrew Jackson's guarantee that the Cherokees will, without doubt, be protected in the enjoyment of those possessions which they have improved by their industry, in exchange for their obedience, in his first annual message to Congress, Source 1. Although the Cherokees followed the instructions of the United States government, taking a census and making clear boundaries for their territory, Jackson did not intervene when Georgia, according to Source 12, the protest of the Cherokee delegation, laid the country into lots touched by Indian improvements and violated the fifth article of the Treaty of 27th of February, 1819, which had previously secured for the Cherokees this land. The Cherokees, 
who had peacefully petitioned the government to return their land, were told that the government was not going to do anything about it. The removal of the Cherokees would allow them to establish their own government on land that would not be unlawfully taken from them. Although it resulted in a great tragedy, the removal of the Cherokee Indians from their land in the southern United States was the right decision, so long as emigration was done voluntarily by the Cherokees and the Cherokees were reimbursed for the land they had previously owned and provided for while they settled in the new land. Removal would allow for the Cherokees to continue to practice their native culture, prosper on land that they could live upon without outside interference, and govern themselves as they felt appropriate. They would no longer have to change their ways to try to become what they were not. The economic, political, and social changes that could be brought about by a move to a new territory had the ability to improve life for the Cherokees as a people and as a nation.